Good afternoon, beautiful people. And the person who is at Dodger Stadium, hmm, who could that be? <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. We're so happy to have you here. Welcome to the Lamita Chamber of Commerce uh, first, first health and wellness program. We're so excited to launch this uh, series of presentations that we'll be doing highlighting and featuring uh, different health and wellness topics that are important to us, not only as uh, citizens in the community, but also ways that we can look at uh, health and wellness in terms of our businesses, uh, our employees and our patrons. And of course, with COVID, um, we probably all have a lot of questions and curiosity. So we are very fortunate to welcome uh, from Torrance Memorial Medical Center, Dr. Zachary Gray, as well as some of his colleagues here, Mary Ford, and Danielle Bujikian. Um, Dr. Gray is going to uh, start off and give us an update right here in the heart of the South Bay on what he's seeing with COVID-19, the vaccines, things like that. And then we are going to have a Q&A session after Dr. Gray's presentation. So I encourage you in the meantime, as questions pop up, um, go ahead and put them in the chat. And what we'll do is I will then go ahead and we get to the Q&A portion of our session today and ask Dr. Gray those questions. Uh, if you'd like to send them to me privately, that's fine too. Um, and uh, yeah, we're just happy, happy, happy to have you all here today. So uh, I just wanna take a quick moment to recognize um, uh, some folks here in the room joining us. So I want to say hello and welcome to the mayor of Lamita, Mark Moranek. Thanks for joining us all the way from Dodger Stadium. <laughs> Um, I also want to recognize a uh, board member, uh, Jim Leadham. He's the owner of Home Health Depot. Many of you may know that business here in Lamita on PCH. Our other board member, Dee Dee McGuire from New York Life. Thank you, Dee, for being here. And we have uh, some of our ambassadors, Tabitha Pennington, State Farm, Bonnie Arona, also a Health and Wellness Committee member and ambassador from Adam Chiropractic here in Lamita. And John Ballard is also on our Health and Wellness Committee. So. Thank you all. And for those who I don't know, I am Heidi Bedzeen. I am the proud president and CEO of the Lamita Chamber of Commerce, and I welcome you all here today. So again, if questions come up, put them in the chat. We'll ask Dr. Gray, and I'm going to ask my fabulous co-host, Danielle Bajikian, to introduce the doctor. Hello, everybody. I am Danielle. I'm the digital marketing manager here at Torrance Memorial. I'm a Lomita resident. I was born at Torrance Memorial. My mom's a nurse here. My sister's a pharmacist here. So you could say this is my second home. And of course, I have my beautiful coworker, Mary Ford, here with me as well. Um, first of all, I just want to thank everybody for the amazing support we've gotten just the whole last year. The community has really stepped up to the plate, and it's noted from our staff, from our physicians to the nurses to our cleaning staff, to our support staff. So just thank you everybody for the support and for doing your part during this whole crazy year. <laughs> so um, now to introduce the man of the hour, someone I just look up to and enjoy working with. I actually started in the emergency room um, here at Torrance Memorial about 10 years ago. So I, I just look up to him. We've actually used him quite a bit the last year to be our voice of reason and our on camera talent. So thank you, Dr. Gray, just for everything. I, I truly appreciate you more than you know. <laughs> um, so Dr. Gray, he is one of our board certified emergency physicians here. He's also the co-chair medical director of our emergency department. Um, he graduated medical school from USC and um, has been working at Torrance Memorial since 2004. And he's been our um, co-medical director since 2014 and just a wonderful person. I, I just admire him. So thank you all. And here's Dr. Gray. <laughs> well, thanks everybody for coming. And thank you, Danielle, for that introduction. I don't know that I can live up to it, but I do appreciate it. Um, so I just wanted to start by putting what's happening with COVID-19 in context. Um, you know, coronaviruses that cause human disease are not uncommon. We have four coronavirus variants that are part of our normal uh, repertoire of infections. Um, they've been in North America for generations and they cause probably a quarter of common colds. Um, what's different about these novel coronaviruses is that they've only recently become human pathogens. 
And uh, COVID-19 is caused by a virus called SARS-CoV-2, which is uh, actually the third of these novel uh, coronaviruses that we've um, encountered in the 21st century. The first one was the original SARS, which uh, originated in China in 2003 and spread throughout the Far East and actually to North America. There were cases in Canada and the US. Um, the second was called MERS in 2012 that originated in Saudi Arabia and was largely confined to the Middle East, um, but also a coronavirus also causing uh, a SARS-like syndrome, a severe acute respiratory syndrome. And then now we have COVID-19, which also originated in China. Um, and there are some particular features of SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19, that make it quite problematic from a public health point of view. Um, and it shares a, uh, a heritage in the sense that these viruses live in animal reservoirs. And mostly we think that they live in bats and they spread to humans through an intermediate uh, host, um, various animals. In, in MERS, it was camels. It's still actually yet to be determined what the intermediate host was in China for SARS-CoV-2. And um, the problem with this particular virus um, that causes COVID-19 is that it has a combination of characteristics that make it very difficult to arrest its spread in human populations. So while on the face of it, it might seem like a good thing, the vast majority of people that come into contact and are infected with COVID-19 are actually asymptomatic. They don't know they have the infection. Now that's good from the point of view of not getting sick and dying from the infection, but it's very bad from the point of view of trying to contain an outbreak. Um, this is in distinction, uh, in contrast, I should say, um, to the way that both MERS and the original SARS operated. They were quite virulent and had short incubation periods. And so it became very clear very quickly that there was a problem and it was much easier to identify and contain people who had the infection. That is not the case with COVID-19, which is what's resulted in its widespread, its pandemic character. Um, it's probably fair to say that MERS and SARS were really more epidemics, and this is a true pandemic because of the way it's been able to spread. Um, so coupled with the fact that most people who get infected are asymptomatic, there is actually also a somewhat long incubation period. And this is the period after which you are exposed before you develop symptoms, if you're going to develop symptoms. And that is estimated to be up to two weeks in COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2, two to 14 days. And so that means there's plenty of time after you get exposed to someone who may have been asymptomatic in the first place before you develop symptoms if you're going to, which you may never and you can still be spreading the virus around during that time period. That makes it very difficult to do effective contact tracing and isolation of specific individuals, um, certainly when you're talking about a large urban population. Um, it also has the uh, characteristic of having a relatively prolonged infectious period once people have symptoms. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more that, about that when we talk about prevention and strategies to mitigate transmission um, in your homes and in your businesses. Uh, with respect to the course of disease, as I said, happily, most people do not become severely ill, but some people do. Um, it's estimated that approximately 15% of people that contract COVID-19 that become symptomatic are hospitalized. And the death rate among those hospitalized is something like 10 to 25%, depending upon when in the course of the pandemic you look and what the hospital circumstances are like on the ground at that particular time. Um, the uh, severe symptoms, if they're going to develop, typically develop by about day seven of symptoms. And again, that's different than day seven post exposure. There's two different clocks running here, which is very important to understand and make sense of the quarantine and isolation recommendations. So there's the first clock, the post exposure clock that runs for that two weeks during which you are potentially contagious if you contracted the illness. And then there is the 
post-symptom clock that starts on day one of your symptoms. So you could be 10 days post-exposure and develop your first symptoms, at which point that post-exposure clock starts. And that'll become important when we talk about quarantine and the different time periods that are important. Um, if you're going to develop severe symptoms, as I said, it typically develops around day seven. And the severe symptoms to watch out for are typically respiratory symptoms, um, shortness of breath being the most important. 80% um, of people have a cough, but again, only a small fraction of people will become so short of breath that they require hospitalization and supplemental oxygen. Um, if you're going to get very, very sick, that usually happens around day 10 of symptoms, which is when people tend to get admitted to the ICU if they're going to. And hospital length of stay will vary um, for moderate disease where you require oxygen and hospitalization, but you recover well. People are, tend to be hospitalized for five or six days for treatment, but in severe disease, hospitalization can last for weeks to even months um, uh, before recovery. And unfortunately, like I said, a fraction of people will not recover. Um, many people ask about treatment and you will read a lot of different things in the media about uh, different strategies people have taken to try to prevent disease with vitamins or antibiotics or steroids or all kinds of different things. Um, what I can tell you is what we know for a fact is that the only treatments that have been proven to work are hospital-based treatments, and they're only proven to work in people that are sick enough to require hospitalization. So things like steroid medications like dexamethasone and solumedrol um, are only helpful and actually are probably harmful if used by people who don't require hospitalization. They're only helpful once you, you enter the severe inflammatory stage of the illness um, and only in patients that require hospitalization. Um, there are antiviral medications we use, again, in hospitalized patients only. These are IV medications that tend to shorten the duration of illness and may have some marginal impact on severity, although it's not clear. And there are a variety of other things that we do from a supportive point of view with respect to uh, breathing and oxygen and ventilation and so forth. There are some other experimental medications uh, such as antibodies and plasma from those who've recovered, um, and then some immune modulatory medications that we are trialing as well that may have some benefit. But again, only in hospitalized patients. Um, there is no evidence that anything that we do in patients prior to them being sick enough to require hospitalization um, is helpful. Um, what to expect with respect to recovery? Um, the good news is that most people who develop this infection even most people who are hospitalized recover completely. Um, there is a uh, subset of people who have chronic problems. Um, in some people, we can identify injury to specific organs such as the heart or the lungs or the kidneys that persist. And in other people, uh, there are sort of vague and debilitating symptoms without uh, definite underlying organ dysfunction that bother people for some long period of time. This is called long haul COVID and it, it involves uh, chronic fatigue and some neurologic symptoms, digestive symptoms and even psychological symptoms. Um, and we don't well understand it yet. And we don't know what to do to treat it or what to expect with respect to recovery yet. Um, probably the most important part of what I'm gonna say is the next part around prevention. And I think if we've learned anything in the last year, it's that the simple methods that we've taken to try to um, prevent spread of this infection work, um, social distancing, masking, hand washing, uh, the most effective three things that you can do are those three things. They have to do with interrupting the spread of the virus based on the way it spreads. Um, most person to person transmission revolves around what's called droplet transmission. The, the, basically when you cough or sneeze, little bits of moisture come out of you. They contain virus, but they're heavy. They only travel so far before they fall to the ground. On average, that's about six feet, which is where the six foot social distancing recommendation comes from. Wearing a mask, staying six feet away and not being in an enclosed, poorly ventilated space dramatically decreases the transmissibility of this virus. Um, 
there have been certain circumstances where one person has spread the infection to many, many, many people. We think this likely involves what's called aerosolization, where the little bits of virus are suspended in the air in much lighter particles of moisture that can remain suspended in the air for hours and hours. Um, and this does not happen most of the time, but it does seem to happen sometimes in some particular convergence of humidity, ventilation, and then probably there's some factors related to the individuals who's spreading it and their illness, where they are in the phase of the illness, how infectious they are, and probably some characteristics about them and their respiratory tract that tend to promote aerosolization. We don't really clearly understand exactly why that happens sometimes, but it clearly does. And so these are the, are the events like weddings and parties um, where one person spreads it to dozens or hundreds of people. Um, it also probably has to do with what's happening in these circumstances. So we know that um, uh, shouting, yelling, singing, those sorts of things tend to promote spread as well. Um, other strategies aside from social distancing and masking and hand washing, ventilation is very important. And there are well-documented cases of indoor spread, like I just described, where uh, improper or inadequate ventilation has been in, implicated. So that's something um, to take a look at with respect to your individual businesses. Um, and then obviously prevention, um, vaccination is going to be a large portion of how we ultimately contain this. And I will say we're in a much better position now than we were last year with respect to vaccination. Although we're nowhere near where we're going to need to be to achieve the vaunted herd immunity that will actually get us out from under this infection as a pandemic. Um, estimates are that something like 70% of the population either needs to be um, recovered or vaccinated uh, in order for us to uh, exit the pandemic phase. Um, the uh, final thing about uh, prevention and vaccines, I get a lot of questions about vaccine safety and you know, just full disclosure, I am fully vaccinated as are all of my colleague emergency physicians and everyone in hospital leadership at Torrance that has any patient contact. Um, the vaccine is safe and effective. Uh, I had the uh, Pfizer vaccine, but I would have been equally happy to take the Moderna vaccine. There's been a lot said about vaccine safety and whether or not we can trust the safety of the vaccine given how quickly it's developed. Um, I think it's important to recognize that that the vaccine is a new technology. Um, all that was required to make the vaccine was the genetic code of the virus um, because these vaccines are RNA vaccines. It's, it's a novel way of making a vaccine. Um, and because of the way the federal government indemnified all the vaccine companies with respect to financial loss and, and pledged to purchase all the vaccine they produced, um, these companies started producing vaccine while the investigational phase was still in progress. And so at the time of approval, they were able to have amassed a large stockpile of vaccine that was available to be deployed immediately. Um, and this is very different to the vaccine development cycle for prior vaccines where no company was willing to take the financial risk of creating a large stockpile of the product in advance of it being authorized for use. And so that, that explains why this vaccine was able to be so rapidly developed. Um, the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines provide 95% protection against infection and essentially 100% infection, 100% prevention of severe disease requiring hospitalization or involving death. And there's another vaccine, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine that is um, nearing regulatory approval, I would expect it this month, or early next month, who's, where the numbers are more like 70% efficacy and 85% percent protection of severe disease or death. Um, as far as other common questions I get, uh, um, a lot of people ask questions about who's at risk for the infection. Um, for severe disease, there are risk factors that uh, tend to make you more likely to develop severe disease. Uh, these have been much talked about, but it's worth recapping. 
essentially any major chronic disease, um, things such as obesity, high blood pressure, diabetes, asthma, heart disease, chronic kidney disease, uh, prior heart attack or stroke, um, those sorts of things. And then age, um, our immune function changes as we age, unfortunately, and we tend to be less resilient when it comes to these types of infections with age. Um, and certainly anybody in the over age 75 category is at much higher risk of severe disease. And we definitely also see that propensity in over age 65. There tends to be a step function change at about that level, although there is a gradual increase in risk over adulthood, whereby you can safely say that someone who's 55 is at higher risk than someone who's 45 and so on and so forth. But there is a um, order of magnitude change when you enter the uh, sixth to seventh decade of life. Um, and then other things that people ask about lately are variants and what that implies. Um, you know, as we have gotten better at analyzing the virus, we have discovered many variants. There are at least seven different uh, North American variants that are endemic in the North American population that originated here. There are variants that have been identified in other parts of the world. People have heard about the UK variant, the Brazil variant, the South African variant. What I can say by and large is that although there may be marginal differences in virulence, it does not appear that there is a profound difference in severity of illness amongst the variants. And thus far, we have every reason to believe that our vaccines remain effective in preventing severe disease, which is really what we should be worried about. There's probably a difference in efficacy in terms of disease prevention. Um, and there are efforts underway by Pfizer and Moderna to retool their vaccines to handle more of the variants. So probably more to come on that. Um, and then the other question people ask is whether or not this virus is here to stay. And I think that, I'm not sure. I think um, three months ago before the variants seemed to be a big problem, I think we could all see a future where a combination of native immunity from having had infection and vaccination would, could have eradicated this or at least suppressed it to the point where it wasn't an issue at all. Now, I think it's probably the case that we are gonna have a fifth um, endemic coronavirus um, that is SARS-CoV-2, but it's also probably true that it won't look like it does now in the future. Most of our um, endemic coronaviruses probably started out in a similar fashion to what happened to us with COVID-19. Um, and over time, viruses uh, become less and less virulent. It's not evolutionarily advantageous to a virus to kill its host or kill a lot of people. Um, what a virus wants to do is, is reproduce and spread. And viruses that reach an equilibrium with their host where they can reproduce and spread without killing their host are going to be most successful. And that's where all the evolutionary pressure lies. So I think that's probably what we can expect. Um, that's what I had prepared. So I'm happy to entertain any questions people may have. Thank you so much, Dr. Gray. I think you answered about three or four questions in my head that I came uh, prepared today. Um, uh, and we do have some questions in the chat. So I just wanna remind those who've just recently joined on board with us uh, for this call. If you do have a question, put it in the chat and I will be asking Dr. Gray those questions. Um, so the first one I'm gonna start off, it's a little, I don't know, controversial or, or interesting. Um, there are people out there who think that this is a hoax, that there is no pandemic and it's politically motivated. Um, how do you convince them that it's real? So that's a difficult question um, because it's difficult to know what kind of evidence to use to convince somebody who is not seemingly convinced by evidence. So I don't know. I think that, um, you know, it's an unfortunate artifact of the polarization of our society right now that uh, people are uh, susceptible to this kind of misinformation. I think that, you know, I can just tell you from personal experience, there is no doubt in my mind that this is real. Um, I have taken care of hundreds of people with this infection. I've watched people die with it. And um, I think 
if you are of a mind to believe that there is some conspiracy that underlies this entire um, ordeal that we've been through over the last year, I don't know how to convince you otherwise because that conspiracy would have to run so deep and it would have had to involve officials and scientists and physicians and people you know at every level throughout the entire society to just strain credibility. I don't see how that's, uh, um, I don't know how to argue against that except for with the simple fact that I don't think there's a conspiracy that could have so paralyzed our entire society and the whole world. Um, I, I think that it strains credibility to imagine that that's even possible. Um, and, and I think I, the one thing I would say is that one of the things about conspiracies is it's really difficult to keep secrets, right? Like you get more than a few people together and it's very difficult to keep people from talking about things. And you'd be talking about a conspiracy that involved thousands upon thousands of people in many, many different countries. And to imagine that that wouldn't come to light after, after a fashion when it's very clear that small conspiracies involving a handful of people all typically see the light of day. It's just hard to imagine how that would be possible. That's what I would say. But I'm a physician that's outside my area of expertise. So I'm sure that there's a sociologist who has a better explanation than that. <laughs> well, I mean, you are a doctor and you see these things all the time. So I'm sure that carries some weight as well. So uh, thanks for answering that interesting uh, question. Uh, the other question, I think, George, we, we answered your first one out there, uh, George Kivett, but he also has an add on. Um, what are you seeing in terms of uh, who's coming into the hospital? So if patients with COVID symptoms come directly into Torrance Mori emergency room, are they separated or are they coming in through another route into the hospital? That's a good question. So um, I think that we're in a position that very early on we recognized that we needed to do something to make the public feel comfortable coming to the hospital. And so, you know, way back in uh, February and March of last year, uh, we segregated our emergency department into two separate areas. And we have the respiratory area where potential COVID-19 cases go and the main emergency department where everybody else goes. We screen people on arrival, both paramedic ambulances and people walking in the front door. And you don't even make it into the waiting room without being screened. And you're sorted to a separate waiting room and a separate portion of the emergency department um, and that separation is maintained through the course of your entire hospitalization. We have separate wards for COVID-19 patients. And to our knowledge, we have yet to have person-to-person -person spread among patients in the hospital of COVID-19. So that strategy has proven effective. Um, and that remains the case, and it will remain the case until such a time that it's not a problem anymore. Good news. Um, why are we not seeing many flu cases? Uh, because social distancing and masking works. That's why. Because the flu, by shutting down the schools and social distancing people and having people wear masks, it essentially completely aborted the spread of flu this year. I have not, there has been one or two flu positive cases that I've heard about but I have not treated a single flu case this year and I would have been in the, in the hundreds by now in terms of number of cases that I've seen. Um, yeah, so it, it, just, it just works to social distancing works, masking works. I mean, there's actually a, a, a very close analogy between influenza and uh, COVID-19 with respect to what's called the r naught or the transmissibility. Their order of magnitude the same in most circumstances. The r naught influenza is between two and three and it's between two and three in most circumstances for COVID-19. This is that number of people that each infected person can be expected to subsequently infect. If R0 is above one, then every person that gets infected will infect more people and the virus will grow in burden over the society. If R0 is below one, then the number of cases will shrink over time because each subsequent person infects less than one person and the virus will diminish down and eventually die away. For comparison, you know, COVID-19 is not even that communicable uh, when you look at it in these terms. Under most circumstances, the r naught is between two and three. For measles, for instance, the r naught is between 12 and 18. So it, on average, something like 15 people would get measles for every person that got measles. They, they would infect 15 more people. 
And the R naught is not intrinsic to just the virus itself. It's actually modulable. So um, there are characteristics of the virus that impact R naught, but human behavior impacts R naught. And what we've seen is when we have had a surge like we had originally, and then over the summer, and then this most recent sur surge, the interventions we take to decrease spread actually decrease the R naught because that's how we have case volume go down is that each infected person spreads it to fewer people than they had been able to spread it to before. So, Well, that's a powerful lesson about the uh, mask wearing and the hand washing. And we were, were we that horrible before? <laughs> yes. I guess so. I guess so. And the distancing, of course. And, and yeah. uh, a few more questions, if you don't mind. Um, how long before refined vaccines come out? And would someone that had the vaccine already take the next one once released? I'm not sure what refined vaccine means. Um, you know, these vaccines that we have, the Moderna and the um, Pfizer vaccine are final finished products. Um, they may be, like I said, um, they may be modulated or, or altered or amended to include protection against additional variants. But I think that's gonna to have to depend upon which variants become dominant and we're gonna to have to respond in a way that's meaningful there. Um, it's predicted that the UK variant will likely become the dominant variant in California, for instance, and likely nationwide by April or May of this year. So I think any subsequent iteration of the vaccine would likely include those variants. But um, my understanding is that it does not take them long to actually create the vaccine. You know, sequencing the genetic code is trivial for them at this point. And producing, they're at a, at, a, at a steady state production, they can produce, you know, several million vaccine doses a day, one to two million doses a day. So um, it just depends upon when it becomes clear which variants are going to be a durable problem before they shift production to, and then, you know, go through the necessary regulatory steps to get the iterated vaccines authorized. Um, and that's distinct from something like the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, which is taking a specific protein and delivering it via uh, a, an adenovirus. So it's more like a traditional uh, vaccine. Those are not able to be retooled as easily or as quickly as the RNA vaccines as developed by Moderna and Pfizer. So, but I don't know, I would expect that we could respond by summertime to a dominant uh, to a, a dominant variant that was causing problems and not well covered by the current vaccine. Um, certainly, we it, less than a year for sure, because that's how long it took to get the first vaccine. So I would measure the time frame in months if I had to guess. It's pretty incredible when you think about what the process has been traditionally and how quickly things were mobilized in order to get the vaccine um, delivered. So yeah, um, 10 times faster, 10 times yeah. faster. It's incredible. Um, on the news today, there was talk of providing a COVID shot yearly, like a flu shot, as a preventative measure going forward. What are your thoughts on that? I think that's entirely possible. I think it depends on where we land with respect to the virus and whether or not it does become endemic and become one of our uh, native coronavirus strains, which I think is very possible. And then also whether or not it is worth it to do that. So I mentioned at the end of my presentation that there is evolutionary pressure on viruses to become less deadly. They do better, they spread, they last longer. Um, things like the common cold, we don't pay much attention to them. They don't bother us much, we don't bother them much. There's no race to develop a vaccine there um, to eradicate the common cold. And if COVID-19 goes that direction, we may not end up with vaccines because it may not be a problem. Um, I think in the near term, I would, not be surprised by something like an annual vaccine. Um, although we're still not sure how durable the immune response from the vaccine is because it hasn't been in widespread use for more than a year, obviously. So we don't know how long the vaccine will provide immunity and we don't know to what extent the virus will mutate and necessitate additional vaccination. So those are still open questions. Um, would I be surprised by an annual vaccine? Not at all. Okay. 
Um, could you speak about those uh, who've been vaccinated and look to travel domestically? Is it a requirement to uh, quarantine returning back into LA County? So I don't believe that there is a, there are specific uh, guidelines drawn up yet regarding travel and vaccination. I think that um, the, uh, you know, I would, so initially it was not clear whether or not a vaccinated person could serve as an asymptomatic carrier of the virus. And there was significant concern about that. And we have examples of that from the past. Um, you know, typhoid, for instance, typhoid Mary was an asymptomatic carrier of that particular infection who infected many, many, many people. So there's clearly precedent for it. Strep throat is another precedent. Um, many people have strep throat and are asymptomatic and can spread it around. So the hesitance to give people an all clear to travel or to stop socially distancing, which is what that would really entail, has to do with the fact that we, are, we were, and I think to some extent still are unsure about the level of protection that the vaccines provide with respect to transmission like that. Um, really recent evidence, like within the last week, begins to look like that the vaccines do prevent transmission and they do tend to uh, reduce that carrier state or at least the potential for it. So I would not be surprised if we see some type of guideline around that. There's, there's my dog as promised. Yeah, that's the mailman. How, how, um, how stereotypical can it possibly get? Um, anyway, I wouldn't be surprised if we, if we do see recommendations along those lines, but for now I would not change behavior with respect to travel or um, social distancing um, on the basis of personal vaccination. Thank you. Um, what about uh, vaccinating uh, kids and uh, when will we be seeing a vaccine for those under 18? Yes, so uh, I think Moderna is actually indicated, if I'm getting this right, for uh, age 16 and older. And I think that there are trials underway involving both Moderna and Pfizer in the um, adolescent and, and, and uh, school age population. Um, there's two reasons why we haven't done that. And one is it became very clear very early on that children, for whatever reason, um, just did not get as sick as they typically, as we typically would expect with things like influenza. So it's just a happy, lucky accident that school-age kids don't develop severe disease. And that is not true for influenza. K kids get sick and die of influenza every year. But with COVID, it's much, much, much less common. So that's good. Um, and then the second thing is that because of the speed with which the vaccine was developed, and the additional regulatory requirements and safety requirements around even studying a vaccine or a treatment in children, um, it just is a much more complicated process. And so those, what I can say is those um, efforts are underway. I don't have any visibility into when to expect a vaccine to be approved for use in children. I suspect it will be Moderna and or Pfizer that get the approval first. Um, but there really isn't the urgency there that there is for the adult population for the reasons I just outlined. Okay. Um, does eye protection such as face shields, goggles, safety glasses help reduce transmission? And I've got a little add on to that too. I mean, not that long ago, a year ago, I guess. Now we were, we were spraying down surfaces, we're following the original orders, we're spraying down our groceries. <laughs> Yes. Um, yeah. So I, I guess along those lines, what is kind of the most current, not only personal protection with this face shield, sometimes you see people with the face shields and no mask underneath. So if you yeah. could just kind of tell us what the best practices are there, that'd be great. I, I think that's a great question. And I think the days of wiping down your Amazon packages are gone, hopefully. Um, so that we're pretty clear that that is not a major route of transmission. In fact, what's called fomite transmission, where you pick up a virus from touching a contaminated surface um, is not thought to be a major contributor. It still probably happens and it's still worth washing your hands and not touching other people, but it does not appear that the virus is durable for any length of time on inanimate objects, um, at least not significant ones. Nothing that would, anything involving shipping or packaging and that kind of thing is probably not a concern. Could you, could the supermarket checkout person touch something and then you touch it, yeah, that could happen. So I would still wash your hands and that kind of thing. But I think you can safely take your groceries and put them away without having to wipe them all down. 
Um, as far as personal protection goes, um, I think that the face shield without a mask is um, uh, not optimal. Um, the, the major route by which people become infected is through the respiratory tract. So you breathe it in and uh, the face shield, because the air can go around the sides and underneath, it's not providing a barrier against breathing it in. Um, it probably provides some protection if you're talking about droplet transmission, if someone coughs or sneezes and they cough or sneeze on your face shield rather than coughing or sneezing on your face, that's clearly better. But I think there's still opportunity if you're close to them to breathe it in around the face shield. And so I, I don't think that's sufficient. Um, I, as far as uh, the optimal combination and what we use in the emergency department uh, when we're dealing with suspect patients, we use a combination. We use eye protection a some form of eye protection, a mask and a gown and gloves, okay? The eye protection can be a face shield or it can be eye protection with some sort of tight fitting goggles or glasses. And some people will do that with a face shield over top for an added layer of protection. Um, I think for individuals in the community where you're not talking about having a sustained close contact with someone you suspect of being ill. I mean, if, if you're in that situation, you should just leave, right? So that so that's not the the protection strategy we should be geared toward in the community. Toward in the community, I think that a reasonable strategy is just a simple mask and good hand washing and social distancing with a six foot separation. I think that, and and I'll, I'll tell you, that's what we were doing in the beginning. So. You can remember, I mean, and, and I, I should say that in the ED, we're also using N95 respirator masks rather than simple masks um, now uh, when we're working with suspect COVID patients. But that was not the case in the beginning. In fact, in the beginning, uh, we were taking care of suspect COVID patients without N95s, um, and we're only using N95 masks when we were doing what are called aerosol generating procedures. So things like placing someone on a ventilator or suctioning their airway or doing something along those lines, giving a respiratory treatment with an aerosolized medication, something where we were at high risk of aerosol transmission because um, we didn't have enough N95s for everyone to use them all the time. And even in that scenario where you were treating COVID patients but not doing aerosol generating procedures, uh, the combination of a simple mask, gown, gloves, and face shield prevented any of our emergency physicians from becoming sick. And um, you know, we, we've seen each hundreds of these cases over the course of the last year. And so and this was long before the vaccine. Um, so I think that most, the general public can take a lot of confidence from the efficacy of uh, the six foot separation, the mask, hand washing, and avoiding prolonged contact in, in enclosed spaces. Now, just backing up a little bit, with regards to the eye protection, and I understand your situation is different when you're in the emergency room or the, the hospital, um, is it not to touch your eyes or is it actually the aerosolized kind of, could it, is that an entry point through the eyes? It's both, it's both. Um, so we, we, um, we have long known that these respiratory viruses can mostly gain entrance through your respiratory tract but the wet part of your eyes, the mucosa of your eyes is another way in which they can gain entry. And, um, and so it, it, both things are true. I think it's more likely that you would contaminate your hand and then inadvertently rub your eyes. That's probably a bigger portion of the protection offered there. Um, but it, it's certainly true that if you're dealing with someone that's coughing, um, having eye protection will prevent them from coughing droplets into your eye. So both things are true. Wow. Uh, one question we have here is when when do you think we can get uh, expect life to return to normal for all of us? Uh, that's a great question, and I could make a lot of money with the airlines if I knew the answer to that question. Um, I think that I don't think 2022 is going to be a normal year, and I think we're going to have to see what cold and flu season 2022 looks like before we know what to say about the future. One of two things is going to happen. 
it's either going to be a big nothing burger this fall and this coming winter, and we're all going to shrug and try to remember what all the fuss was about, which will be fantastic. And then we will know we're through the other side, or we will see another surge next fall. And if that happens, then all bets are off. So I would, I, I would plan through, certainly through the end of 2021, that we are going to be doing some version of masking and social distancing, probably in conjunction with a uh, return to school for children under, you know, modified conditions at school um, and a return to um, in-person activities such as dining and shopping and, and not large gatherings, but reasonable sized gatherings. I think that probably is in the cards for late 2021. And 2022 it may look much more normal, but we won't know that until the end of 2021. I, if I were planning, I would plan on 2022 not being normal. If I had to make plans. Like from a strategic point of view, what you're budgeting for. Right, right. Um, I, I like to tell people that it's not necessarily that we're going to be going back to the way it was before, but what are we going to be doing to continue to move forward with what we are now adopting as, as natural practices, you know, just all of the things that we're, we're taking into as precautions. Um, that is what it is. So everything has changed. Yeah. I just got off of an event and how we're trying to create uh, hybrid events now with virtual and in-person. How do you do that right. safely? So, it's an adjustment process for sure. Um, I did want to cover as far as uh, the hospital's concerned, um, if people need to uh, come in for, for their labs or surgery, uh, sort of what, what the position is right now at Torrance Memorial. And also as well, when should people go to the ER? When should they not? Because I know that was a huge burden on, on your resources. That's a good question. And I meant to include that in the beginning and I just totally forgot. Um, so. Here's what I would say is if you are exposed and contract COVID-19, um, the vast majority of people are gonna be just fine. I would recommend the first thing that you should do is talk to your doctor. Um, and they will probably, for obvious reasons, want to do this by phone or virtually and discuss your symptoms with your doctor. Um, most doctors will be able to reassure you over the phone and provide advice about what to do. Um, the severe symptoms of COVID-19 that require hospital-based care, again, all revolve around breathing and respiratory illness. So definitely, if you are short of breath or becoming short of breath, you should come to the hospital. Um, other reasons to come to the hospital, rarely it happens that people have so much diarrhea or vomiting so much that they become dehydrated um, or delirious. Um, so confusion, delirium, dehydration. Those are very good reasons to come to the hospital. Um, I, and I would say that uh, certainly if you have one of the underlying medical conditions that predispose you to severe disease, you should at least call your doctor. We're not recommending that people come to the hospital with COVID-19 that test positive just because they have diabetes or heart disease or so forth. But they should be on the lookout for shortness of breath. And if they begin to develop that, that's when we, we would recommend they come. The labs and surgeries are, are okay. So right? as far as uh, getting labs done and so forth, uh, yeah, I think that it, laboratory testing sites have their own protocols in place for trying to keep their employees and the public safe. So you can safely do those things if you're asked to by your physician. Uh, surgery, uh, we are in the process of restarting surgeries again. Um, so we went through a period in the spring where we suspended sur surgical procedures and we did so again uh, this winter. Um, and we're now at a, a place with respect to hospital resources and prevalence in the community where we feel like it's safe again to restart surgical services. And just to be clear, it was never that we felt that we couldn't safely do a surgery. It wasn't about that. It was about the fact that even surgeries that are routine occasionally have problems and some people wind up in the hospital after a surgery in circumstances where it wasn't anticipated. And during the peak of this winter surge, we literally had no hospital beds. We had no ICU beds. We had ICU patients on in non-ICU settings. We had 
two patients to a room in a lot of circumstances. We had increased the ED volume by double bunking patients in ED rooms because we were just so overwhelmed. And so it didn't make sense to even have the occasional incremental person require hospitalization because of a routine surgery. But we're not in that situation anymore. So surgeries by and large are beginning to proceed again as normal. Oh, I lost, I can't hear you, hang on. Are you there? There, I hear you now, sorry about that. Okay. Um, so I guess the earbuds uh, need to be recharged. <laughs> Seems like it. <laughs> Perfect timing. Um, I just wanted to uh, say, uh, and Danielle, you've got a couple of great things here in the chat. If everybody could just make sure if you need more information and resources, Torrance Memorial has some great, great resources at their website, torrancememorial.org slash COVID-19. Uh, and they're also having a Facebook Live tonight at 6.30 p.m. You can tune in on the uh, Facebook page for Torrance Memorial. That's facebook.com slash Torrance Memorial. Um, and I just wanted to let you know, Dr. Gray, you've got some fans here. They really appreciate your um, topic and uh, recognize all of you, uh, all of our healthcare professionals uh, at Torrance Memorial and in the industry. Uh, you are our heroes. And so we thank all of you for taking care of our families, neighbors, our community. And uh, to, to echo your words, Dee Dee McGuire, uh, we're very grateful to you and for your sacrifice and dedication. Um, so I appreciate all these questions and um, thank you so much, Dr. Gray. Uh, please take advantage of them as a resource, um, everyone. Go ahead. If I could say one more thing, um, I, I should have said this before, but the people who work in the hospital were extremely appreciative of all the support we received from all of our partners and friends in the community over the course of the past year. So donations of meals and supplies and financial contributions, and we couldn't have done it without you. So thank you. Well, thank you. And thank you, Danielle and Mary Ford. Uh, anything else you want to cover, Danielle? I think he covered everything I'd know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, everyone. I appreciate your time. And thank you so much, Dr. Gray, and to everybody at Torrance Memorial and in our healthcare industry. Stay strong, stay safe. I hope you all got something great out of this. The replay will be available at the Lamita Chamber website, lamitachamber.org. And uh, so make sure if you want to go back and replay this, it will be available to you probably by uh, close of business tomorrow, uh, if not sooner. So thank you so much. And, and we appreciate all of you. Um, we'll see you soon. Take thank care, everybody. Thank you, doctor thank you. and everyone thank from Florence Memorial. We appreciate you. Likewise. You. <laughs>